morning and happy Sabbath. It is so good to have our church full again. It is wonderful to be back together with our student body um, and just be able to worship together in the church as a church family and a school family. So it is just wonderful to be here. Um, just a quick announcement this morning. Uh, just a reminder that we have our offering box out in the foyer and there's tithe envelopes there. You're obviously always welcome to um, contribute to the church through our online giving. And just a reminder to our church family that all of these students here that you see, a lot of them are here because of your gifts and because of the generosity of other people who just understand the, um, the importance of a Christian education and the beauty of what this school offers and this church offers. So just a reminder to keep that in mind, and obviously also Coble, we have two schools on this you know, property in this campus that are committed to educating our youth and in, in knowing who Jesus is. So please continue to keep that in mind and to give generously to that effect. Um, at this time, Josh has an announcement. All right. Um, I have two announcements or a couple of announcements today. Um, I would like to first talk about um, a, a ministry that you can get involved in. I know that a lot of times when we have uh, people who come into this community, a lot of times we have, we have people who come in because their, their kids are coming here to GCA. Um, and also, I think if you've been here in this community, you wonder sometimes, how can I get involved in the, in the life uh, of this church. The GCA church exists to capture the hearts and minds of young people and to develop them into fully devoted followers of Jesus. And sometimes that's a big vision, and I don't really know what that means, and I don't really know how to get involved. Well, I'd like to talk about one way that you can get involved uh, this school year. We're going to be starting up what's called Connect Groups. Connect groups are basically interest-based small groups where um, if, you, if you have a hobby or if you have something that you really enjoy doing and you would like to lead out a group, um, you can do that and we can have students sign up to be a part of your connect group. So um, I, I've talked to a couple of you here in this, in this room today. I know that we're looking at maybe having a tennis group. Um, if you're interested in playing tennis, uh, you can sign up for that group. We may have a baking group. If you want to do baking, you can sign up for that, and you can bake, but you can also eat bread, which is really good. Um, I'm probably going to do a running group. If you want to come running with me, maybe Mr. Lawson will help out with that, and we can do a running group. Um, the catch is that if you're going to lead out a group, we want you to do what you enjoy doing together and we want you to uh, have fun doing that. But the catch is that there has to be a spiritual component to that group. I don't know. And that could be whatever uh, you design it to be. It could be a prayer time together. It could be accountability partners together. It could be a worship thought as a part of that group. But there needs to be a spiritual component to it. We want you to do life get together and we want you to, and we want our kids to understand that you can you can have some strong bonds and fellowship within the church. Now, I know that a lot of times uh, we're worried about being overcommitted, that we don't want to commit to too much. This group is going to meet once a month during our midweek time. That's from eight to nine o'clock. So, if you're interested in leading out a group, um, you are only committing to one Wednesday night per month from 8 to 9 o'clock. So if you want to do if you want to do a CrossFit group, Darren Scott, I'm asking him, where's he at right now? If you wanted to do a CrossFit group, you would meet from 8 to 9 o'clock, maybe spend 15 minutes in prayer and worship, and then spend 45 minutes uh, working out or something like that. So that's, that's a connect group. If you are interested in leading one of those, or if you have an idea, or if you want uh, help coming up with ideas, uh, please see me after church today so that we can uh, put those sign-up sheets out and have our students sign up to be a part of your connect group. So that's our first announcement. Um, the second one, uh, I'd like to just, just highlight the fact that today is a good and happy Sabbath, uh, but last Sabbath was an especially happy Sabbath as well, because last Sabbath, one of our students, Rory Mills, decided to give her heart and to give her life to Jesus forever. Who says amen to that, all right? All right, yes. 
we, we met out at Lake Altoona. It was a beautiful setting. It was, I mean, I cannot think of a better way to close the Sabbath, Sabbath evening, last Sabbath evening, than to, uh, to, than to have a baptism. And I'm so proud of Rory and her decision that she has made. And we have, Rory, I don't know where you're at, but we have a gift from the GCA church for you, so please find me after church. She, she strongly asked me not to bring her up front, so I'm, I'm not doing that. Um, today. Um, however, we just wanted to highlight this decision. We're so proud of you. Uh, with that comes a little piece of church business because uh, not only is she baptized into Christ, but, but she is now a part of our church. We want her to be a part of our church. And so today I would like to ask if there is a motion to accept Rory into the GCA church. There's a motion and there's a second. Everyone in favor, please say aye. aye. Yes. All right. Along with those transfers, please forgive me, I'll get off the stage here in a second, we have a couple of other items of business to attend to this morning. Um, this is the, the second, we're gonna, we're gonna, we have two transfers, one transfer in and one transfer out. Uh, this is the second reading to transfer of membership of Rachel Rickerson to the GCA church from the Leicester church, Central SDA church in the UK, all right? We've already done the first reading. This is the second reading. Is there a motion to accept her? Motion a second. Can everyone please say aye if you're in favor? Yes. And that's carried. And the second one is a membership transfer out of the GCA church. Um, this is one of our former staff members from several years ago, Martin Surridge. He's going to be transferring out of GCA into the Lodi Fairmount uh, Church in California. Is there a motion to accept that transfer? A second. All in favor, please say aye. And that carries. Thank you so much. At this time, uh, Dr. Gerard uh, is going to talk to us. A couple of uh, things. A couple things that uh, wanted to talk to you about. Uh, we some might be wondering that a number of people here are wearing masks today. Um, the uh, Academy Administration decided this past week that while we gather here at the uh, GCA Church that our students would indeed uh, wear a mask or a face covering. Uh, it is uh, optional for others who are visiting. We encourage you to wear a mask with um, what is happening with current spread of the virus in our area. Um, and the number is rapidly increasing. We frankly are trying to do what we can to stay in school because if too many people get sick, then we have to go to virtual. No one wants to do that. And so we need to do what we can to try to stay healthy. And some of the things that you do when you're together, if you get a lot of people into a space and those people are not able to distance, and those people are in that space for an hour, and those people are singing, which means they're exhaling a lot, then that is a circumstance where you wear a mask. So we're hoping and praying that that day will go away and we'll be able to be without it. But for now, that's what we're doing. Thank you for supporting that, for helping with that, as we do what we can to try to stay healthy. Every year at this time, I usually uh, make a brief uh, speech, talk about how we work together in this church as far as the church service itself. Um, this is because we come together for our first Sabbath, and we have young people coming from churches all over the United States, and indeed all over the world. And so we come together, and different churches operate differently, and, there, and cultural issues might be there that make things a little different. So this is a discussion about this church. Um, but I do think that some of these principles carry over. So this talk is primarily for students uh, at GCA, but I invite those of you who are older or younger to listen in. Uh, because there are probably a couple ideas here that might be for you. We come here on Sabbath mornings for the purpose of worship. 
And worship, by its definition, is a very unique activity. To worship means that you show honor and respect to God. One author said that worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. That's the act of worship. We come into this place and we are here for something that is very unique. It is unlike other gatherings because here we come to worship God. Worship is our act of honoring, respecting, loving, and being in submission to God. God is the focus. We are not the focus. When we become the focus, we take the place of God. When I walk through the back door and I enter this space, it is a unique and different space. The Bible talks about the common, or also called the profane, and the holy, and they are different. different. The Sabbath is actually holiness in time. The time of the Sabbath is different from the rest of the week. This space is dedicated, built, paid for, for the purpose of honoring God. This space is dedicated to worship. And so the way we act here is different from how we might act in a gymnasium or in some other kind of public space. Uh, in our church, we do choose to clap. Some churches don't. We do. It's always appropriate if there's something you have heard that, you, that resonates with you also to say amen. We don't yell. We don't scream. This isn't the place for that. We also don't talk to our neighbors when somebody else is up front talking, singing, praying, or reading. We are the focus when we talk to our neighbors rather than listening. We are the focus when we wear clothes that say, hey, look at me. I'm what it, this whole thing is all about. I show respect when I'm in an attitude of reverence. And honoring God says that I can sit through a service without walking out, especially when someone is talking or singing. There are a lot of um, performances you might go to that would involve music or a theatrical performance. And if you show up late, you will be held at the door and you will not be allowed to go in because it is an act of disrespect to those performing as well as an interruption to that program. And you're encouraged not to stand up and walk out just because you all of a sudden get the urge to do something different. What we're doing here is far more important than any performance or theatrical performance. It is worship. So we prepare in advance, we think about it, we use the restroom, we get a drink, we do what we have to, we don't stand up in the middle and walk out. Earlier, we heard some beautiful prelude music. That prelude music is for the purpose of preparation for worship. When that music starts, actually, we kind of have our other stuff taken care of. And we're thinking about the fact that we're getting into a mode of worship and that we're going to focus on God and not on ourselves or not on the people around us. Because we are in this place and we are paying close attention, then the people that are up front, we're showing respect to them. Students or other people up front, whatever it is they're doing, praying, talking, uh, reading, uh, singing, performing music, we show respect by paying attention, by not talking, we show respect by our posture also. If you're a toddler or a baby, then you may not be able to stay upright for a long period of time, and you have to kind of flop over and, and get all weak-backed and, and, and take a little nap. By the time you've hit the ninth grade, we assume you're past that. So if you're having trouble understanding what I'm saying, sit up. It's not your living room. We also understand a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is one that does not demand an answer from you. And so if the pastor asks a rhetorical question, 
it does not mean that you turn to your neighbor and say, well, let me discuss it with you that at length, what question that was just asked, and we all degenerate into a lot of discussion. That's a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is for the purpose of you to think about it. Um, during our prayer, we have a, a prayer in the service, uh, and it, that prayer, that pastoral, what is typically called a pastoral prayer, that prayer, we almost always kneel for that prayer. And so as we kneel, we kneel together, and the prayer is made, and at the close of that prayer, the organ will almost always play a short piece of music. That's prayer response music. That is a time at the end of the prayer when you can think about and reflect on what has been said in that prayer, perhaps even silently adding your own prayer to what has been said. We stay on our knees until that brief piece of music is completed, and then we get up and we sit in our pews. And at the close of the service, we also will take most of our talking and, and our interaction, which are all good things, but we take it out to the lobby or outside. There oftentimes may be post blued music, and you're encouraged to stay and listen to that also. Also is a time for reflection. A worship service is a joyful experience, and any, everything I've just said is not for the purpose of making it dour or negative. It is a celebration but it is a celebration that is not focused on me. It's focused on God and what he has done for us. Thank you. One of the things that we do on a typical Sabbath is that we will bring a family up front and we will do an interview just to get to know that family. Uh, we, uh, we are a GCA church family and, and we want to make it a point to just to get to know each and every one of the families. Well, today, I'm not bringing up a family because really, if I were to interview the Kirstein family, we would need a whole service just to, just to kind of understand the Kirstein family. But I'm bringing up one person of the Kirstein family, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. But this is Zach Kirstein, and I uh, am bringing, up, bringing him up here because he's about to do something epic. Um, but before we do that, um, Zach, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and how you're connected to this community? Sure. So um, back in 2015, I think, um, my family moved here from Richmond, Virginia, um, so that I could attend GCA my freshman year. Um, I graduated in GCA uh, 2019, and I had an absolutely amazing experience. And my brothers are here, Cameron and Tristan as well. So yeah, it's part of my GCA experience. So real quick, what, was a, a couple, what were a couple of things that you enjoyed about your time at, at GCA? Oh, there were so many, but um, one of the things that I enjoyed the most was the music opportunities, um, Mr. Torsney and the praise band experiences, also leadership experiences that I was able to get at GCA, and the education. Um, guys, this is a really good education, and Southern, like, it, was, it has been so easy to transfer there, um, so it has been absolutely amazing going from there. Awesome. Zach is an amazing pianist. We always love it when he comes back to, uh, to play here in the church. Um, real quick, can you give us a little bit of a, a, an update on your life, what you've been up to for the last, since you've graduated at G, from GCA? Okay, yeah. So since I graduated, I went to Southern, um, and I am a finance major um, at Southern. So I've been doing that f for two years now. I'm uh, halfway through my junior year. And I, yeah, I'm a part of Engage Ministries at Southern, which is kind of an extension of Praise Band. Um, and it's really cool if you guys get to go to prayer conferences. Um, normally, Engage Ministries plays there. And um, that's something I've really enjoyed at Southern as well. Awesome. And this summer, he's been uh, interning at Advent Health Gordon. So um, just, just don't forget me when you go big, OK? And just Chaplain Josh, just remember that. Um, so. So I brought you up here today, we, we want to get to know you, but I brought you up here for a specific purpose, because this year, Zach is going to do something kind of outside of normal, I guess you would say. Um, 
you're deciding to take a whole year off of school and tell us what are you going to be doing in this next year? So tomorrow, um, I am headed to Bolivia. Like tomorrow? Like tomorrow at noon, my plane leaves. Um, okay. And I am going to Familia Feliz. It is an orphanage and a school, and I'm going to be a student missionary there until May. All right, so this guy's taking a whole year off of school. You know, everybody's all about trying to grow up real fast and move on with life, but this guy is taking a whole year off to go down to Bolivia and, and serve with an orphanage, right? Awesome. So, so I got I to gotta know then, why did you decide to do something like this? Tell me why, what, what brought that on? What went into that decision? So one of the biggest reasons I wanted to do this was to spread the gospel and to show people the love that I have been able to experience from Christ. Um, more specifically in Bolivia, this orphanage, no one in an orphanage is coming from a great background or a good family situation. Um, and fortunately, I have not had that. I have been able to grow up in a loving family, and these kids don't really know what that's like. Um, and so the reason I chose this area is because I want to be able to show them what it's like to be a part of a loving family. I want to be able to give them that experience for the time that I'm there um, and create that atmosphere. And I'm really excited to get to be able to know these children more and, and also just show them the love of Christ in maybe a different way that they haven't been able to experience. So you've experienced a great family situation. You want to give back to that. Now, you're not just going to be hanging out with them like, you're not going to wake up in the morning in your apartment or wherever you're staying and go to the orphanage. Like, what's the situation going to be like for you? Yeah, so I'm actually staying at the orphanage in a house with, with some of the, um, the guys that I'll be staying there with. So they're going to be staying in your house. Yeah. <laughs> so Zach is going to become a dad <laughs> in, like, three days, <laughs> basically. This guy is going to be a dad. Yes, this is awesome. <laughs> So you're going from zero to, like, dad of, like, seven kids in just a few days. And I know that that's going to be such a, a tough but rewarding, rewarding experience um, for you. I, I want to ask a couple more questions. How do you think this experience is going to change you as a person? Or how do you think this is going to deepen your relationship with God? I think that this experience is going to change me for the extreme better. <laughs> Um, I want to take this opportunity and just be used by God in ways that I, I can't necessarily do right now. Um, last year, I kind of asked God, like, hey, use me however you want. And it's been, once you pray that, it's crazy how fast and how quickly that happens. Um, and just in a short couple months later, I was signing up to, to be a student missionary in an orphanage. Um, I'm hoping that I can become more reliant upon Christ in situations where I don't know and they're outside of my comfort zone, but that they'll be pushing me um, to become more reliant on, on him. All right. So what, as you think about, I mean, you've gone through some, you, you kind of have an understanding of what you're going to be doing down there. What are some challenges? Because we want to, we, we don't want to just interview you and send you off and forget about you. We want to be praying for you uh, this year. And so what are some challenges that you think you might experience that we can pray for? Well, the number one thing that I'm currently worried about is my language barrier aspect. Um, but I think in a couple of months that will be, that will be pretty, pretty taken care of. Um, but I think the orphanage is it's just it's in a place of need. Um, and either that's financially or that's through prayer or that's just through thoughts and, and telling people about it. I think that's one of the biggest things that um, can happen. And, and prayer is super powerful. And to have a church family here praying for me in the orphanage is going to be an amazing thing. Awesome. How, do you, how can the GCA church help as you think about what you might need? I mean, do we need to take up an offering of Big Franks and send them down? Like, like, what is it do you think we can do to help you during your time away? I think the biggest thing is just, um, just prayers and, and just um, keeping us in your thoughts as you go throughout this year. Um, I'm not sure exactly, you know, everything they need, but I just, I know that um, anything that you guys can do to help is going to be an amazing, uh, an amazing thing. Awesome. So I'm going to 
quiz you here for a second. I remember meeting you when you came to Academy Days, your eighth grade year, right? Just little, you know, little Zach. And, um, and I preached a sermon that, that weekend. Do you remember what the sermon, what the tagline was? Yeah, it was called Go Big or Go Home. All right. And, now, and, and that's uh, one that we've talked about before, that, that, that uh, idea. And, and uh, dude, you're going big. And, and we're so proud of you, man. And I just, uh, um, to see, to see uh, our students grow up and accept the Great Commission, like that is why we do what we do here. And we're so proud of you. And uh, I'm going to stop now. And at this point, um, I want to invite your family to come up. Um, and I want to invite uh, any friends of Zach who would like to come up. We're going to lay hands on Zach, and we're going to have a prayer for him. I'd like to invite the elders to come up as well. I definitely want the, I, I definitely want the family to be here to, um, to lay hands on, on Zach. I know that this is a, a crazy experience, and we just want to send you off with a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask Mrs. Gerard to, to, uh, to, to pray for us. Our alumni director is going to pray for one of our alumni as we, as we head off, as he heads off tomorrow. Father in heaven, as we gather this morning, just here to support Zach, to pray for him, um, to let him know how proud we are of him. Father, I pray that your spirit will fill his heart, our hearts, and may we be reminded of your faithfulness and your goodness. God, you are great. Nothing is too hard for you. And so as Zach goes into this challenging year, we know that you're going to go before him. You're going to be behind him. You're going to provide everything that he needs because you are a good and faithful God. Father, we're, we're thankful for Zach's willingness to serve. It's going to be a, a year that's going to be filled with challenges, with stress, with um, problems maybe, but huge, huge rewards. And so, Father, we just thank you for allowing him to have this experience, and we thank you for his willingness to go. Father, as he's talked about this year and thought about the challenges that may face him, we just ask that you will fill him with your love. Give him big love for these kids. Give him patience. Give him courage. <clears throat> Give him language skills that he's going to need. I pray, Father, that you will help him to be able to demonstrate your love to these kids in a way that will make it tangible and real for them so that they can see Jesus in him every day. Father, help him to learn to trust you completely for everything that he needs. And may he always know that you are with him and that you're never going to leave him or forsake him. And Father, as we close this prayer, we claim your word in uh, Joshua 1.9. You said... This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And we know that you're going to go with him to South America, and you're going to be with him every day. And we thank you and praise you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. It's always good. It's always good to be back. And I know you can hear me really well. It's good. This is one of my favorite songs to start a year off or even start a service off because a lot of time, like Pastor Josh said yesterday, we come and we worry about where we are in our state of life, the sins that we have committed or the failures that we have. And with all the new people that are coming in right now, this is an opportunity for us to, to leave them outside and come before the throne of God as sinners and as failures and as people that mess up and 
lay ourselves down before him and celebrate who he is in our lives and what he can do. So we're going to ask you to sing with us. We're going to ask you to stand so you can sing. And just take the words of this song in. We are all sinners. We are all poor and needy of Christ's love. And that is what we are here, is to, to celebrate that and worship God today. Jesus, you ready? Stand to sing. Love and like to uh, invite the children up now. This is your special time, guys. And kids, you know, we are still collecting the lamb's offering, so you are welcome to walk around and see if anyone would like to, uh, to give to the lamb's offering as Auntie Dana comes up to do the, to do the children's story.
I'm Dana, and today I'm going to be telling children's story. So, once upon a time, there was this chocolate cake. Do any of you guys like chocolate cake? Well, I have a massive sweet tooth, so. This chocolate cake was unlike any chocolate cake you've ever seen before. Me and my mom made it, and we put a condensed milk thing on top so that it had, like, the perfect texture. It was, like, it was really good. And on top, we had whipped cream and Oreos, and I love Oreos. So I started to get to the age where I could be left alone, so my parents were starting to let me be alone in the house. Um, and this was a big responsibility. Um, my mom, she made this whole list of things for me to do. So I had to clean my room, and I had to practice piano, and I had to put the dishes away and reload the dishwasher. So my parents were going to leave, and I was like, bye, I love you. I was just excited to be alone in the house. I could play whatever, like, loud music or whatever. So I cleaned up my room, and I was thinking about that chocolate cake. And I was practicing piano, and the whole time, I wanted a piece of that chocolate cake. And I put the dishes away, and guess what I was thinking about? Yes, the chocolate cake. So I was reloading the dishwasher full of the dirty dishes, and I put the last one, and I thought to myself, wow, I deserve a piece of that chocolate cake. But I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to have it, and I was alone in the house, so I, I definitely shouldn't have, but I thought that I, I worked so hard, and I just deserved it. So I reached into the refrigerator, and I got the cake out of it, and the cake was being held in this antique glass cake container and it had a cover on it and yeah it was my grandmother's so <laughs> I took I took it out and I put it on the counter and the thing about the cake was it was eaten just enough so that if I cut it like in a certain way no one would notice that any cake was gone so I put the I put it on the counter and I took the cover off and I put it on the edge of the open refrigerator why did I do that? I have no idea. Um, so I got a knife, and I started to cut the cake. And I turned around, and the refrigerator door closed and knocked the glass cover onto the ground, and it shattered into a million pieces. And I screamed because I was so scared. And I didn't know what to do. I couldn't believe what just happened. Um, so I kind of started to clean it up, and I waited for my parents to come home. My mom came home first. So I went and I told her, I was like, I'm so sorry, I broke the antique glass, my grandmother's cake holder. And she was like, oh, no, your dad's going to be so mad at you. He's going to, he's going to be real, <laughs> he's going to, he's going to take your DS and he's going to take your Wii and he's never going to, okay, my mom didn't say this, but he's never going to love you ever again. That's what was going through my head. So I was just waiting there for my dad to get home. And he came home, and I met him outside because I was, I was so scared. I needed to tell him right away. And I was crying, and I was like, I'm so sorry. I broke the cake container. And I thought that he was just going to be so mad at me, but he, he forgave me. He didn't get mad at me at all, and he gave me a hug, and he said it was okay. So when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about for children's story today, I thought of the story, and it reminded me of how God is with us. Every day we make so many mistakes. We make so many horrible mistakes. But no matter what we do, he always loves us. Nothing that we ever do will ever stop God from loving us. So anytime you feel like you really messed up big time and God doesn't love you, it's not true because he always does. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the Sabbath day and that we can all come together and worship you. Thank you for this new school year. It's really exciting. Um, Please be with everyone throughout the rest of the church service, and thank you for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go back to your seats.
Father, we thank you for your Sabbath day, and we thank you for your many blessings. Father, we thank you for this first week of, uh, we, for, we thank you for this first week of school, and we thank you that we're able to gather in the church. Father, please be with all who are ill, and Father, we please, and we specifically raise Mrs. Gerard's mother in prayer. Please heal her, and please guide her, please guide the doctors so that they will know how to heal her. Lord, you are the master doctor, and just please be with them and please heal her. And Lord, please be with Pastor David in the sermon and help for it to go well so that he may preach your will. We love you, Lord. In this I pray, amen. First of all, students, welcome. It is so good to have you back with us. It feels like a different place. When, yeah, thank you, Mrs. Gerard. We had one clap for that. I, I know everyone else had it in their heart. Yes, we've been missing you. So thank you for being here. And I promised myself I wasn't going to make any gym references. We've done that already. But I also just want to say that it feels good to be able to see your eyes. Because before, when we were here to get be, there together, I couldn't even see you. And so now I can hold you accountable. I can tell if you're falling asleep or if you're chatting it up and I'm watching. That's the point. So it feels good for us all to be back together. And I just also want to remind us that it's such a blessing to have the diversity of ages come together. And, and one of the things we like about our church is that we all get to worship together and it's a unique environment. And so I just want to encourage you younger students to reach out to some of the old people that you see here from week to week. Not all at once today. You outnumber us, okay? So not all at once at the same time. Um, but throughout the year, uh, take advantage of this moment when you see people that you don't know and that you don't see working for you at school especially, introduce yourself sometime to them. Because the truth is some of them may be a little scared of you, right? And so make the first step. Older people... Don't be scared of them. They're not that scary. So try to once in a while bridge those gaps and meet someone new while you're here at church. But we're all happy to be worshiping together. Let's, let's start with one more word of prayer. Father God, we just pray that you will speak to us this morning, that we will understand who you are better. May we learn something of you, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Rachel, Rachel had a problem in that she kept losing her money. And when I say losing her money, I don't mean that she was misplacing her money. I don't mean that she was like sitting at somewhere and it would disappear. Rather, it kept disappearing from her bank account, which is a problem if you want to have money in your bank account. And she be, she's had this problem, but just kind of started all of a sudden. And she started tracing back what happened prior to this. And she realized there was a moment where she had gone out to eat and she had her purse sitting behind her. And someone came up and brushed up beside her and her wallet or her purse was gone. And in her purse, not only did she have her credit cards and her driver's license, but she also had her social security card. And so she put two and two together and she realized this must be the moment where things went wrong. This is identity theft and someone has my information and they're taking money out of my bank account and there was nothing she could do about it. It would just simply disappear. And so she decided to close her bank account and open a new one to kind of lose the trail of whoever was after her. And it started happening again. And so she closed that bank account and opened another one. And it happened again. And she thought, maybe the, someone has figured out where I live and they're stealing stuff from my mailbox. So she closed her mailbox. She sent everything to a P.O. box that she opened up. She thought maybe now she had solved the problem, but she kept losing money. 
As she was reporting this, this is an episode from This American Life years ago. She was reporting this to the, the guy interviewing her. She said, well, I was really depending on my live-in boyfriend at the time. He had a steady job. He worked at a fancy government job, and he was paying for a lot of things. I could only afford to pay rent because all my money kept disappearing. I would get my rent money out, and then the rest of my paycheck would just disappear. And so she was worried, quite worried. Well, over time, she got so paranoid about people taking her stuff, she closed all of her bank accounts and started holding on to just cash. And she got down to where she just had $2,000 left. That was all she had to her name, put it on a cashier's check, and hid it in her drawer in her bedroom where nobody could possibly find it. And so one day she needed it. She went to her drawer, and that check was gone. And it suddenly occurred to her that there was one person who knew where that check was. And she went to the bank, and sure enough, as they gave her a copy of the cashed check, she could recognize her boyfriend's handwriting as he had forged his signature or her signature onto that check. This guy, this is pretty bad, right? Like, this is like bad relationship situation. As she started to unpack things, she realized everything she thought she knew about this guy was totally wrong. He didn't have a job, he faked having a job, and he had been living off of all of her income that he kept taking from her bank account. And the person that she was engaged to, actually, to marry, was the person that had been plaguing her for years. Sometimes, the person that we think we know best, we don't actually know at all. Sometimes people that we think we know a lot about them, it turns out there's things about them that we don't know. And that's a pretty negative start, actually. But it happens both ways. If you ever had someone in your life that was the opposite, where you meet them for the first time and you think you don't like them at all, and you think you know who they are and what they're about, and you're like, I would never be friends with them. And then one day you find out, well, actually, maybe we can be friends. Maybe you start dating that person, right? Like these things kind of happen. People, you think you know who they are, and then you one day discover you don't actually know who they were. You made assumptions, and sometimes your assumptions were right, and sometimes your assumptions were wrong. Well, today we're starting a series about God, and it's called God is Not. And what we're doing this series is we want to challenge some of our assumptions about God to look at some of the things that we think we might know about God or things that maybe have stuck with us either in a very deliberate way or sometimes we've just kind of picked that up along in our journey and question, are these things right or wrong? And so today we're starting with the idea that God is not actually angry, and we'll unpack that. But first, I want to start with Moses. There's this, uh, this verse in Moses. Well, and we're, gonna, we're going to be in Exodus 34. You can start turning there. And there's this verse in Exodus 33, preceding 34, chapter 34, where Moses says to God, show me your glory. In my version here, Moses says, show me your glorious presence. This is verse 18. Verse 19, the Lord replies, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name Yahweh before you. I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. And the Lord continued, look and stand near me on this rock as my glorious presence passes by. I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. The first step in understanding who God is, is you have to be willing to step into this and be ready to see what's actually there. For Moses here, he asks God to show him his glory. Whatever this is, whatever kind of danger this may bring, let me step into this moment and you show me who you are. And the question we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to do the same? You see, it's easy for us to follow a God that we kind of create on our own. It's easy for us to think we know who God is and we start to find out that God actually looks a lot like me because I'm kind of making him out of my own image. But the question is, are we willing to see who God is for who he really is, how he reveals himself to us. And so Moses says this, and I've always kind of pictured this in my mind as it describes him being hidden in the cleft of this rock. I picture God's glory being about something very visual, right? I've always kind of pictured it like Thor. Not like just Thor, but Thor like this. 
You know what I mean? Like the moment the lightning comes down and the eyes light up. Like this is glorious moment. This is glorious God kind of look. And that's always what I've assumed it means when Moses is going to have the glory revealed to him. But we find in the next chapter that's not what God actually has in mind. Maybe there's some of that, but there's something else entirely. God's glory is about the revelation of who he actually is. So we're going to pick up in chapter 34, verse 5. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him. And he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh, the Lord, which is basically in the original. He's saying Yahweh, Yahweh, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and their grandchildren, and the entire family is affected, even the children in the third and fourth generations. This is the moment where God reveals himself to Moses in all his glory. And what do we learn from him? We learn who he reveals himself to be. And by the way, it's easy for us to be looking at this outside of the chronological order of, the, of Scripture, What's happening here is this is the clearest revelation of God to this point. Previous to to Moses, there hasn't been this kind of revelation of God. Prior to this moment here, God's kind of coming even to Abraham in a way that makes sense to Abraham in his context, in his culture. Even the very name that God most often uses is God Almighty, which is talking in the the form of El, which is the, the, the common name for God. Which is, in other words, he's using the same kind of wording, the same kind of verbiage that Abraham would have, like his contemporaries, the people around him, how they would have been thinking of God. God Almighty, this is the kind of El God we're talking about. But here, God introduces himself with a unique name, and he's saying, my name is Yahweh. It's different from what you know. It's different from all the other gods you've heard about. I am this God, and who am I? I'm a God that is compassionate. I'm a God that's full of mercy. I'm a God that's slow to anger. I'm a God that's full of love and a God that's full of faithfulness, steady faithfulness. So we could unpack each word here, but what he's giving you is a picture of someone who has compassion on others, who's moved by the experience of people around them. It's a God that has, that's merciful in the sense that he is a forgiving God. That's the idea of mercy, is that you're merciful to either the needy or you're merciful to the sinner that he's slow to get angry. It doesn't come easily. And then he's God that's loving, that's full of faithful lovingness. It doesn't go away. And he's full of faithfulness, meaning, meaning it's firm. It's unmovable. It's something that's resilient and loyal. These are the attributes of God. This is the glory that God talks about. But of course for us, as we're reading this, I don't know if you're like me, but as I'm reading through it, it's feeling really good. Like this is a really good revelation of God until you get to those last couple of verses that we read. Remember what it said? It ends with, but then I will continue to punish generation to the, to the third and the fourth. It doesn't let the guilty go unpunished. And it's like, God, you're going in such a good direction for a while, but all of a sudden you make this right-hand turn. And we're talking about God not being angry, and yet here it sounds like, I don't know, like God might be getting a little bit angry, right? Like there's kind of like God's loving and he's slow to anger, but here he is showing where he might actually get angry at some point. I want to talk about this for a second. If we want to understand the anger of God, and God not be angry, we need to understand that God's not an angry God. But there are moments where there may be anger because love requires anger from time to time. Follow me for a second. I want to show you a picture. Uh, this is a picture of my son holding a, uh, a young puppy. Um, now, this is, this is uh, not, <laughs> the puppy's unnamed at the moment. Um, because we're uncommitted to this puppy. And I think we have commitment problems. But we, we took this, uh, this guardianship dog into our house recently, and we've been kind of on the fence about whether we're actually going to keep it. Mr. DeChicka says the second I post a picture like this, 
I've cemented the deal. But here's the secret. Here's the secret is that, don't tell my kids this, but as long as we're not committed to keeping the dog, they're going to have to really carry extra responsibilities to keep the dog. Does that make sense? Don't tell my kids this, but every time the dog makes a mess inside, right now they're really eager to clean it up. But the second we commit to having the dog, I think I'm going to be cleaning it up. So we have this dog, but this dog is so tiny and fragile. Like you pick it up and it feels like it could break apart. I want to show you another picture here just to give you perspective. We got the dog a bed this week. This is my other dog trying to sit on this dog's bed, <laughs> right? So this dog is Tucker, and we fully own and are committed to Tucker. But Tucker's not fragile like this other unnamed puppy is, right? So I want you to picture this. I want you to go to have an imaginary moment. Say this dog comes outside of my house. My neighbors have dogs that are big dogs like Tucker. It would not take a very aggressive act for one of these neighboring dogs to come and do something terrible to this unnamed puppy. Right? Like some dogs are gentle, some dogs are loving, but some dogs don't even know their own power. And if my neighboring dogs got out from their area and they let them out of their property, accidentally they came to my property and they bit this little dog that I haven't even committed to you, what's my, what's my response going to be? I'm going to be so angry, right? Because this little dog is fragile and it's in my care and I feel like it's, I need to take care of this thing. I need to make sure that it has a good life. And if their, their, their careless act allowed their dogs to come over and damage this dog, suddenly I would find myself angry. And here it is with God. There are moments throughout Scripture where you see God acting in anger. But every time that you see him acting in anger, it's in response to people being hurt. God, from the perspective of understanding that the actions you take don't exist in a vacuum, and things that you do may have an impact on the people around you. It may cause someone else to get hurt. And whenever you see some kind of anger coming from God, it's coming from a protective instinct for the people, the humanity, that he actually cares about. But the other thing I want to look at is I want to understand the context of this idea when he's talking about not letting sin go unpunished. We have to understand where this is. You see, when, Jesus, when God says this to Moses, he's actually kind of repeating himself, which I'm actually really glad about, because I know I repeat myself a lot. I'll find myself telling a story to someone, and their eyes glaze over, and I realize I'm doing it again. You have you ever that moment? I'm trying, I try to reverse and act like I... It's not actually happening. I try to change the story up a bit, but I do it. I find myself repeating myself, and it's terrible. But God apparently did the same thing. You go back to Exodus chapter 20, and this is part of the, the same story. In Exodus chapter 20, this is where God is giving Moses the Ten Commandments. And he says this. He says, you must not make... You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affliction for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. Sound familiar? The entire family is affected, even the children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. So if you get rejected, he's saying, he will lay those sins upon them. But verse 6, I lavish... My unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commandments. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that there's very similar language, right? It's reminiscent of the thing that God will say just a few chapters later. The other thing I want you to notice is that he's making a clear contrast. There is judgment involved in the verse, but it's only to the third and fourth generations. When it comes to his mercy and to his loving kindness, it's for a thousand generations, and so what God is effectively showing is that this thing's not actually balanced. When we're talking about his mercy, when we're talking about his love, when we're talking about his patience, it's very heavy in one direction. When it comes to his judgment, it's a little bit lighter. But then something happens. This is, again, in the Ten Commandments that we're reading this. The rest of the story is that what happens is Moses is up there for 40 days getting the Ten Commandments. And then what happens? He gets instructions about the, tab about the temple, about the tabernacle, about how this is to be constructed. This goes on for chapters with lots and lots of detail. And we find out before he comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, what's going on with the Israelites? 
They've made an idol. <laughs> so God is writing about this thing. This is where this little inscription is, is about not having other idols, not having other gods before me. And while he's writing about this, down below are the people making an idol. There's this awkward confrontation between Moses and his brother. Aaron, he's trying to like defend himself. And what he says, go back and read it. It's in chapter 33. He said, hey, don't blame me. The people were just wanting a God to lead them in the wilderness. They gave me the gold. I put them into the furnace and out popped an idol. That's literally what he says. It's just kind of like it happened. We just put it in there and it happened. And now we're at this weird point in the story wondering what is God going to do here, right? What's God supposed to do? Because he just said that he's going to punish the sins to the third and to the fourth generation, to those who reject him. And it's to those who follow him, who don't reject him, that he shows his mercy to well, then we get back to this point where God reveals himself and he repeats himself. And as he repeats himself, he talks about being slow to anger. He says he lavishes unfailing love to a thousand generations. Same thing he said before. But then he introduces a new thought. Verse 7, I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. You see, suddenly what we see is this is an opt-in moment, that his love is extended to us. The justice is important because it's his intention to stamp out sin permanently. It's his intention to stop suffering from happening. But the forgiveness happens, and the love continues for a thousand generations. Now, one thing to understand here, too, is when he's talking about this sin, he's using these three different words. He says the sin of iniquity or wickedness. He talks about... Uh, the, the sin of, I just lost my place. Let me go back to it. Rebellion and then the regular sin. So sin itself, there's, there's all kinds of different definitions of sin. And he's covering all the bases with them. The last kind of sin he's talking about is called missing the mark. The sin of omission. Things where you don't actually intend to do it. Then there's like the legal kind of sin. That's the middle sin he talks about. It's Pesha. This idea that you make a legal wrongdoing and that gets you in trouble with the law. And then there's the other kind of, it's like the collective all kind of sin, which is iniquity or, or wickedness. You just do bad things. You see, when we do things in life, we make mistakes sometimes. And sometimes we choose things that are not actually good to differing degrees. For example, last year, earlier, actually I guess it was this year, early this year, I found myself in a little bit of, of legal trouble. Yeah, it sounds bad when I say it that way. I was driving down the road, and I'm going to a stop sign that I go to almost every day of my life living here. And I didn't, didn't completely stop. What do we call that? I think they call it a California stop. I kind of got slow, and then I went down. It was safe. I looked for traffic. There was nothing around, and I drove through. But it's not true. There was something around. There was a cop. I didn't look carefully enough. It sits by the fireworks store, just a little heads up. <laughs> I've seen him there many times afterwards. And I drive blissfully unaware that now I'm being followed by a cop. Well, what I also didn't do that day was I was in a hurry leaving my house, and I forgot to get my license. So let me go back to the, the stop sign. I didn't realize when I went to the stop sign that I didn't stop. It was just a bad habit of mine. When I left the house, I was in a hurry, and I thought to myself, I should get my license. But I never get pulled over, because I drive the speed limit. I'm a safe driver. This isn't going to happen. And so I intentionally violated the law there. And then thirdly, as I got pulled over by the cop, and I'm giving my license, I learned that I also had an expired tag on my car that I hadn't noticed, sin of omission right there. You see, the cop may or may not be merciful with you at this point, but God is saying in these moments, whatever kind of failing you have, whatever kind of shortfalling you have, I cover these things. I forgive these things. For a thousand generations, it keeps coming. And you see that this is something, and we have lots of texts I'm going to skip. 
You're welcome. But there, you see this thing, like, quote it throughout Scripture time and time again. And what we see in these Scriptures is that God is actually not only doing this out of his nature, but he's eager to do this. That's something that he wants to do. You see this quoted in Malachi. You see it quoted in the Psalms, that this is something God is instinctively doing. Sometimes when you're asked to forgive something, someone of their sins, when they have wronged you, you'll do it, but it's begrudgingly. You're with me? You ever do this? There's times when someone wrongs you and you know you should forgive them and you have to will yourself to it. The description God is given or giving us is that he is eager to give this forgiveness away, that he wants to offer forgiveness. So if God is like this, the question is, why is it sometimes that we don't feel like God is like this? Why is it sometimes it feels like you might be under the thumb of God? Why is it sometimes it feels like God might be looking after you, waiting for you to make a mistake, waiting for you to slip up, so that he can convict you of the wrongdoing and maybe punish you for the wrongdoing? And I would offer that part of the reason may be because sometimes we as followers give that expression through our own actions. Sometimes we don't reflect the same kind of merciful God that we follow. And then it becomes hard to believe that that's what actually is part of God's nature. There's a story in the Bible of a prophet named Jonah. We did a sermon on this last year. And the prophet Jonah actually gets upset at God because God offers forgiveness. And when he gets upset at him, this is at the very end of the chapter, Jonah chapter 4, you find that he actually quotes from this passage. And he says, God, I knew who you were. I know that you're a compassionate God that you're a forgiving God, an unfailing love. He quotes all these things from Exodus, and he's upset. So the question we have to ask, like, why is it sometimes that we struggle with our own anger issues as followers of God? Why is it that Jonah struggled with his own anger issues as a follower of God? You see, we all have anger issues, right? Like, some of you have really demonstrable anger issues, Yeah? You know who you are. Like, there's some of you that you're very transparent about what you feel inside. And the way you show that anger, we all know when you're angry. It's okay. It's at least you're being honest and real with yourselves. There's others of us that we have anger issues, but we kind of keep it more close guarded. It's more internal. It's more like a low rage seething that takes place. And so we may be struggling with anger, even though other people don't see it. And we live in a world with anger. Can we talk about masks and vaccines for a second? Would that be a good conversation? Yeah, yeah. So, so just this week, same day, I'm reading news stories. You've probably heard some of these yourself. There was a, a school board meeting in Franklin, Tennessee. Have you heard about this? And, and they were upset about the mask mandate that was about to happen. And so as the people left this board, there was a riotous crowd outside. They were angry. Same day I read this news story, I read another news story in The Atlantic, and it's talking about people, doctors, professionals, who in their words are having harsh and angry feelings about their non-vaccinated patients. And then it goes on to describe their feelings, which I'm not even going to actually read because it's kind of embarrassing to read. And it's like, here we have like a clear representation of America right now, the two different sides and all the anger that comes with it. We live in a world that's angry. You think different than I, you have a different opinion than I have, you make me want to think something else, I'm going to be angry at you. But God says, that's not who I am. And if I'm not, you're called to be something different too. And so here's the question. How do we find ourselves believing in a God that's not angry and then living in a way that's not angry? I'd offer you two things. First of all, is we actually have to know the God that we follow. You have to be like Moses and say, show me that glory. Show me who you are. You have to explore it. You have to read it for yourself, the scripture in its full context, to understand the character of God. And as you do that, you start to have a picture of the person you're following. But then second to that is that you have to spend time there 
in order for a transformation to take place. You see, Jonah knew who God was, but he still had the anger in his heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. It's a common verse about transformation. We might not realize that when we read this verse, it's pointing back directly to the story of Moses and God being revealed to him. In fact, it's talking about this, uh, this veil that goes over Moses' face after the glory. So the veil goes over his face. He comes down from the mountain because it's too shiny. He covers his face, and that's the veil. And, and Paul uses this as a metaphor. And he says in verse 14, before we get to our verse, it says this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. When you believe in Christ, this veil is removed so we can actually see the glory. Verse 16, but when, whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. See, Paul sees this. He sees this story, and he says that not only do we understand God's glory by his character revealed, but we find ourselves, as we encounter this story, finding ourselves having that glory reflected in our own lives. It changes who we are. John chapter 17, Jesus talks about him being the most clear place to find that glory, also referring to the same story. 17 verse 6, I've revealed, the Greek here is your name, to those who who you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Verse 24, Father, I want those who have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. In verse 26, I have made you, your name, known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. See, Jesus recognized that he's the most clear expression of God's glory that we have. Ellen White talks about it as God's thoughts made audible. And as we see the the life of Jesus, as we see the, the actions of Jesus, we see the glory of God. We start to recognize that the God that we're following is not an unjust God. The God that we're following is not an angry God, but it's a God who loves us, God who is compassionate with us, God who is merciful with us, a God who is faithful to us, and a God who has steadfast love in us. He says, as you see me, you see the Father, and as you see me, you see glory, and that glory transforms you. May we seek that glory every day. May we understand the true character of God as we see it through the life of Jesus.
God, we have all done things in our lives that deserve an angry response from you. But your response has instead been goodness, forgiveness, and grace. You came to this earth and you spread your arms and you died on a tree in response to our sin. May we see the goodness in you as your true glory, we pray in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.